Okay, so um, I would like to welcome everybody to uh, the third in our webinar series for 2010, Arts and Healthcare Careers, Clarifying the Roles of Artists and Creative Arts Therapists. Uh, our presenters today are Sally Denman and Ronna Kaplan, as you can see from, your, um, from the first page of the slideshow. And uh, we would like to acknowledge the National Endowment of the Arts for its support of the consulting service, um, which makes it, this webinar series possible. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for registering and attending what is sure to be a wonderful presentation from Sally and Rana. Goodness knows they've been working really hard on this PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. That's true. <laughs> um, a lot of back and forth to really, uh, and, and, I've, and I've seen the offerings and they're pretty good. So um, I wanted to also notify all of you that we will be recording this session um, and the recorded version with the PowerPoint presentation should be available in the archives um, in the near future. Okay. Now, the format, of, for those of you who haven't taken a webinar before, the format is uh, it lasts a total of one hour, and Rana and Sally will be uh, giving a presentation of their slideshow for about the first 40 minutes of the presentation, at which point we will open the question, uh, we will open the question and answer period. Um, those, the questions that you submitted in advance, if you submitted questions in advance, um, have been sent to Ron and Sally to review, and if the questions aren't covered in the in their actual presentation, then they will um, address them during the question and answer portion. Um, once we run out of the advanced questions, we'll open the floor to live questions, anything based on the presentation, follow-up, you know, information that you wanted um, based on what actually uh, the actual transcript of the presentation. Um, let's see what else. Um, oh, yes, and you don't have to put your phones on mute because I'm uh, Sally, Rana, and I are on lecture mode, so once, um, once I put us into lecture mode, rather, um, we will not be able to hear you. Uh, so that will avoid all of the uh, feedback from people going back and forth from mute. Um, does anybody have any questions before we begin? Okay. Hello? Yes. Um, yes. Are you going to be advancing the slides, or do I need to do that? You don't have to do anything. As long as you've okay. been able to open it on the web browser, you'll see that we will that um, the presenters will be advancing the slides. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else? You're going to remind us how to advance the slides, right? I am going to. Okay. Oh, right, right. Then let me just here. You'll be. There's able nothing to on our screen right now. That yeah. Right. So yeah, on. As soon as I click on you, uh, who's starting? Sally, are you starting? Uh, Rana, and then I'm it goes starting. to me. Okay. Well. Sally, uh, you are now the you you now have the controls. I do. Okay. Yes. So you okay. see, you have your little star there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, if you want to. You mean just, the, the arrow thing next? Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Let me just put everybody into lecture mode for. The conference is in lecture mode. Okay. So now you can click on uh, you can click on Rana's name and you'll get the pull down menu. Okay, so I'm going to switch it to Rana now then. Right. Okay. okay. Um, make presenter. Okay, I'm going to do that right now. And then she's going to introduce herself, and then she'll switch it back to me. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. As uh, Michelle said, I'm Rana Kaplan, and I am a music therapist, and I'm the director of the Department of Music Therapy at the Music Settlement, which is a community music school in Cleveland, Ohio. I have about 35 years of clinical experience and several years of experience as a manager, um, senior staff uh, in our school, and a supervisor. And then I'm also a consultant for SA, and I've been that, doing that for about four years. And uh, just as a sideline, I'm also the president of the American Music Therapy Association. So we thank you for coming today, and at this time I'm going to have Sally introduce herself. Okay. Uh, uh, it didn't get switched back to me. No, anyway, I will switch it okay. while you're talking, okay? Um, so, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sally Denman, and uh, I've been working in the arts and healthcare field for about 30 years. I started off as an art therapist, um, and I worked as an art therapist for about 10 years. And for the last 20 years, I have been coordinating a large fine arts program for a state psychiatric hospital in uh, Napa, California. 
And in this role as the arts administrator, I hire professional artists of all different disciplines, visual, literary, performing artists, um, who come in and teach classes with the patients, do performances, put on workshops. Um, so I have been uh, in this field in, in both the arena of the creative arts therapist and the professional artist in healthcare for quite a long time. I'm also a SAW consultant. So now we will switch to our first slide. And so come on in to learn. This is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be learning about the different creative arts therapies and what their educational and training requirements are and things that they have in common. And then we'll be talking about uh, how artists and art therapists work in healthcare settings and what the differences and similarities are between these two different fields. And now back to Rana. Hey, thank you, Sally. All right, so uh, first I'd like to start out with a quote from Arts Advocacy Day. Arts Advocacy happens uh, once a year year uh, at the national level, and this is from the booklet that they put out last year. So around the world, the arts are emerging as an integral component of healthcare. Today, healthcare initiatives that involve partnerships between art and health professionals are demonstrating real benefits, and these are improving patient outcomes, helping people make connections, and engendering a sense of community. Also from Arts Advocacy Day, here's a little bit more information about the arts and healthcare. This is a diverse field representing over 16,000 medical, arts, and creative arts therapies professionals. And all these professionals are dedicated to transforming the experience of healthcare by connecting people with the power of the arts at key moments in their lives. And the arts and healthcare integrate art, including literary, performing, and visual arts and design into a wide variety of healthcare and community settings for either therapeutic, educational, and or recreational purposes. And I'd just like you all to notice this picture here because it's a very old picture, and this just gives credence to the fact that the arts and healthcare have been going on a long time. Here you see the nurses dancing with the patients. In fact, some people would say that the arts and healthcare have been gone excuse me, been going on a very long time. For example, back to when David played his harp to soothe King Saul. And uh, recently, uh, as in the last 50 to 60 years, uh, in terms of creative art therapies, which we're going to talk about now, uh, the, these have actually been established professions. In 1950 was the first music therapy organization, and then in the 60s, art therapy and dance therapy organizations began. So the creative arts therapies um, are composed of some of the following, dance and movement therapy, poetry therapy, music therapy, drama therapy, and art therapy. And in terms of defining them, uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of their commonalities. So the creative arts therapies use arts modalities and creative processes during intentional interventions in therapeutic, rehabilitative, community, or educational settings. And we do this to foster health, communication, and expression, to promote the integration of physical, emotional, cognitive, and social functioning, and to enhance self-awareness, facilitate change, et cetera. And continuing on, although each creative arts therapy is unique and distinct from another, all the creative arts therapies share related processes and goals. So participa participation in them provides people with special needs ways to express themselves that may not be possible through more traditional therapies. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the creative arts therapies are not just for people with special needs. They could be for people who might have a brief medical issue or for wellness. And we'll go into many more uh, uses of the creative arts. And uh, this quote that is on your slides is from the National Coalition of Creative Arts Therapies Associations, which uh, its acronym is ENCADA. <clears throat> okay, ENCADA has a number of member associations, which uh, we'll talk about um, one by one, but they also, again, as I said, have many commonalities. So um, the ENCADA member associations are established, and they all have professional training standards, including 
Each of them has a code of ethics. Each of them has a credentialing process. They all have annual conferences, journals, and newsletters. They all have standards of clinical practice, which the therapist must uphold. And they all have approval and monitoring processes. <clears throat> Going further into the commonalities among the creative arts therapies, the arts are a universal language. Many people say that. They also occur naturally in our environment in many settings. You can go to art museums. You can see public art uh, on murals outside in the city, sidewalk chalk. You can hear music at baseball games or in religious services, in the supermarket, etc. You can attend movies, all of those different arts. Every, you know, a lot of people read. <laughs> All right. And the arts are socially appropriate activities and leisure skills. And they may provide a predictable time and reality ordered structure. So what do I mean by that? First, time, time ordered structure. Um, the form and the structure of various art forms can be grounding. For example, music has a, <clears throat> a certain duration. So participation in music or in any other arts experience has a duration. So for um, a certain length of time, someone has his or her time ordered. Then in terms of reality ordered, what I mean is, for example, if you're working with a patient with Alzheimer's disease, actually I would say if I am working with a patient with Alzheimer's disease and he or she is singing the same song as I am singing, then we have the same shared reality at that time. Another thing I would say is that if you and your peers attended a very moving film, I'm going to use Schindler's Bliss as an example, that's a shared reality by everybody who's in the theater watching that movie. And um, I know from my experience when I saw it, that was the only movie I ever went to where everyone in the theater was totally quiet <clears throat> at the end of the movie. So we all had that shared reality. And I think, Sally, you wanted to say something about that as well? Um, yes, that the, that the arts are one of the things that is, is very um, stress-reducing about them is that they are presence-inducing. And so it, it's, again, about that, you know, that sort of predictable time oriented structure when you are involved in an arts activity you're it's difficult for your mind to be somewhere else when you're dancing you're in the dance when you're playing a musical instrument when you're creating a painting and that fact that your your mind is very focused in that moment you know helps to take away the stressors of you know other things going on around you thanks all right and now continuing I'm waiting for it to go so, oh, I pressed, there we go, okay. All right, um, continuing with the commonalities, the creative arts therapies have many commonalities. So they all can provide opportunities for experiences in self-organization and self-expression. Now, again, I think you all understand what self-expression is. I'm going to give you a little bit more of part of my definition of what could uh, be involved in self-organization. It could in include reduction of stress or anxiety. In it could imp imp include improving one's focus. Um, elements of the arts might help this. For example, rhythm. A lot of times we, the rhythm could be very um, focusing. Uh, we could use the ISO principle where we start where the person is. So if somebody's very agitated, we might move quickly or play music quickly, you know, in a fast tempo. And then gradually, if we're, if our goal, depending on what our goal is, trying to get somebody to slow down and relax, then we could gradually adjust the tempo of the movements or the music as the person is slowing down. This is also called entrainment. So a lot of times the um, elements of the various art forms can provide self-organization. <clears throat> the form of the music, you know, you know that um, a chorus is going to come and then there's going to be another verse, things like that. Um, there's many opportunities provided and experiences in relating to others. There's offer opportunities for participation at one's own level. So you don't have to be a gifted artist to have a meaningful experience in a creative arts therapy modality. Uh, a person who is verbal or nonverbal physically fit or physically um, having limitations. Uh, all people can have a benefit 
regardless of their levels of functioning. And arts therapies can be adapted for a group or individual experience. They could reinforce non-art skills such as speech, language, math, social skills, and importantly, they can give people with disabilities who are not necessarily disabled in their musical or artistic skills a chance to excel. Possibly they can become leaders and may be looked at in a different way. Okay, finally, uh, we've talked about some of the benefits of creative arts therapy, but I just kind of want to sum them up with this slide. So there's the possibility of making connections. Patients, clients, whatever we like to call them, can make connections with um, the art form itself. They can make connections with the therapist. They can make connections with other patients or clients or with family members or friends. In terms of transformation, there can be great transformation and sometimes small transformation. Uh, we can move people from isolation to participation and interaction, perhaps from aggression to more appropriate means of touch, et cetera. In terms of building on foundations, uh, an example might be if someone had previous experience in an art form, that might be one of his or her strengths or there could be strengths in other areas that we can tap into and build upon. And finally, reaching aspirations. In creative arts therapy, we can help people reach their individual potential and personal goals. So now I'm going to turn the leadership back over to Sally for a bit. Just a moment, please. Here you go. Okay. So now... Oops, getting it to switch to the next slide. Hmm. You, you got to go back. Uh, oops, we missed one. Yes. Okay. So uh, we're going to begin to talk about the specific uh, creative arts therapies. So I'm going to start by talking about art therapy, and which is a form of psychotherapy that uses the creative process of art making to improve and enhance physical, mental, and emotional well-being help people to resolve their conflicts, develop interpersonal skills, reduce stress, increase self-awareness, and achieve insight. Um, often through a piece of, of art that you do, you can find out something about yourself that you may not have even been aware of, or just the act of producing it can help you, you know, look at things a different way, and so thus you know, achieving insight, which is extremely important in any therapeutic process. Um, so art therapists have an understanding of the psychological aspects of the creative process and the uh, different effective properties of different art materials. So they understand, you know, that if you're going to give someone paint or clay, you know, that might, you know, um, loosen things up and, you know, you may or may not want to do that, whereas giving someone pencils or something that's a little more constricting may help somebody that needs a little bit more control. So art therapists are very familiar with all of the different art materials and how they work in these ways. They are also um, trained to recognize nonverbal symbols and metaphors communicated within the art process and, uh, you know, things that might make, you know, that might be difficult to express in other words or other modalities. So uh, to become an art therapist, you uh, first you need to have a background in art, and this is true with most of the creative arts therapies. Um, that you know you need to, if you're going to be a, an art therapist, you need to be an artist, dance therapist, dancer, etc. So you start off with that, and then you get a bachelor's degree uh, um, in either art or psychology, and whichever one you've majored in, you will often minor in the other one. Um, and then you go on to get a master's degree, and the coursework uh, that you need to do is established both as an as a undergraduate and in the graduate level is established by the American Art Therapy Association. They have specific educational standards for their programs. And, and I thought just a little aside on this. What I'm going to be talking about is mainly um, for the American Art Therapy Association. We, we realize that uh, though other countries have different standards, but I'm just going to be talking about the U.S. standards. 
so then you, you go on and get a master's degree in art therapy. And there are two different ways of doing that. You can go to a program where you get a specific master's degree in art therapy or a master's degree in counseling or another related uh, field that has an emphasis in art therapy. And again, this would be something that would be approved of, a program that would be approved of by the uh, American Art Therapy Association. Then the credentialing that you can receive once you have completed your master's in art therapy, the first level of credentialing is to become a registered art therapist uh, with the initials ATR. This means you've completed the graduate work and then you have also done so many supervised hours of postgraduate clinical experience and then you can apply for the ATR credential. Then once you have the ATR credential, you can uh, apply to become board certified, which requires completion of a national examination demonstrating comprehensive, com comprehensive knowledge of the theories and clinical skills used in art therapy. Okay, so this slide is, uh, these are two of my favorite quotes that help define what art therapy is. Um, and these are by Judy Rubin, who's a very well-known uh, art therapist in this country, and she's been in the field for about 40 years, and she actually started off as, Mr. as uh, the art lady on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And um, she's published probably about a dozen books on art therapy, and she's really one of the greatest uh, I have found for putting into words the differences um, and what art therapy is and what it is not. So I'm just going to read these great quotes. The essence of art therapy is that it must be true to both parts of its name, art and therapy. The primary goal of the art activity, therefore, must be therapy. This usually includes assessment as well as treatment. An art therapist also needs to know a great deal about a wide range of ways in which the arts can aid in the understanding as well as in helping people to grow and to change. Just as it takes years of study and discipline to master the visual arts, so it takes time to master psychology and psychotherapy. As with all forms of therapy, understanding and synthesis in art therapy come only with experience. To integrate knowledge about art therapy requires clinical training and involves thousands of hours of supervised work with patients. So now we're going to move on to talking about dance movement therapy. Oh, can uh, I interject, yes. interject something? Uh, we had mentioned when we were putting this together that even though that previous slide was about art therapy, it really could apply and cross over to any of the other arts therapies. You, know, you could just substitute the word music, the words music therapy, of you know, being music and therapy, or dance and movement and therapy, or drama, et cetera. So, Absolutely. Sorry. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. Um, so dance movement therapy is a psychotherapeutic use of movement to promote emotional, cognitive, social, and physical integration with movement as the primary medium used for observation, assessment, research, therapeutic inter interaction, and interventions. And dance movement therapists work with individuals, groups, families um, who have social, emotional, cognitive, and or physical problems, and they are helping clients to improve their body image and self-esteem, to develop communication skills and relationships, expand their movement vocabulary, gain insight into patterns of behavior, and create new coping skills. Um, so, you know, for instance, I one of the things that I do here is I teach a dance class, but I am not a dance therapist. But in my dance class, I will sometimes notice that you know a particular patient may have trouble following the rhythm, or their movements are very restricted or very odd in some way. And so I will note that, and then I might refer them to a dance therapist to to really kind of get in there and figure out what's going on for that person and try to expand through their clinical work with them. You know, their movement vocabulary. Vocabulary. So moving on. So uh, to become a dance therapist, uh, what do you need as an undergraduate? First of all, like the other ones, you need to have a dance background and then a liberal arts uh, uh, education with coursework in psychology at the, uh, at the BA level. And then you would go on to get a master's degree, as dance therapy is a master's uh, level profession. And then as a graduate of an ADTA, and ADTA stands for the American Dance Therapy Association. Oh, and 
Also, all of these uh, organizations, their websites are going to be listed on the resource page that you will see at the end of the webinar. So graduates of American Dance Therapy Association um, approved programs are then eligible to become a registered dance movement therapist just like the art therapist can become a registered art therapist. So there are, uh, just like with art therapy, there are two levels of credentialing for dance movement therapists. First, you become registered, which signifies that the individual is prepared through their training process to practice dance movement therapy in a clinical education or educational or rehabilitative setting. And then uh, they can also then go on and become a board certified dance movement therapist, which signifies that they have the education and experience to teach dance movement therapy and to supervise interns, um, and they have completed a rigorous examination process. The dance uh, movement therapy um, certification board also recognizes an alternative route uh, to dance movement therapy training, um, which requires a master's or a doctoral degree in another human service related field. So it could, could be psychology, sociology, um, from an accredited school in combination with specific dance movement therapy coursework and extensive uh, dance movement background. So um, then poetry therapy. Poetry therapy reflects the interactive use of literature and or writing to promote growth and healing. Uh, poetry journals and other forms of literature are used to foster personal growth and to help achieve therapeutic goals. The profession of uh, poetry therapy is, uh, tra the, their training and credentialing is done by the National Federation for Biblio Poetry Therapy. And the federation is the credentialing arm of the poetry therapy field. And then there's a separate organization, the National Association for Poetry Therapy, and that's the membership arm of the poetry therapy field. So to become a poetry therapist, um, unlike dance, um, art, and music therapy, you actually do not need to, you need to have some type of a writing background, which we all have, but you don't need to be a professional writer or a published poet or something like that to become a poetry therapist. You just need to have, you know, general writing skills. Um, so there are uh, two levels of credentialing. First, you can become a certified poetry therapist um, and then also a registered poetry Therapists, and they are both licensed professionals with extensive mental health training. And the uh, registered poetry therapist completes advanced level training and fieldwork commensurate with the highest levels of clinical practice. Although some of the trainees who undertake both of these credential training while they are enrolled in clinical graduate programs or completing postgraduate requirements for licensure, these designations can also be conferred upon those who have completed um, graduate work within a mental health field or um, as an MD and have obtained licensure. But with poetry therapy, you don't get a specific degree in poetry therapy. You're getting your degree in another clinical field, your master's degree, and then you get the poetry therapy certification on top of that. And the website um, that uh, is on the resource page will give you extensive information on the training that's required and how to obtain that. So I'm going to go, go back to Rana. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about drama therapy. So drama therapy is the systematic and intentional use of drama and theater processes and products, and this is to achieve therapeutic goals such as symptom relief, emotional and physical integration, and personal growth. And there are <coughs> credentials of registered drama therapists board certified. And um, applicants must have master's or doctoral degrees in drama therapy, and then these would be approved by their association, which is the National Association for Drama Therapy. Again, that's on the website list as well. Uh, or you need a master's or a doctoral degree in a field related to drama therapy. These related fields could be very diverse, drama, theater, psychology, counseling, special ed, social work, occupational or, ther or recreation therapy, or any of the creative arts therapies. And um, then you still need supervision from a registered dance therapist. Oh, did did you change this to me? 
Um, it should have. Oh, let me let me try again. Sorry. Yeah, it doesn't say me as I can't Oops. advance the slides. Oh. Can you now? Ah uh, yes. Thank you oh, so much. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Got it. That's okay. All right. So some more information about drama therapy. There is an extensive and intensive internship requirement. There's also a large requirement for drama and theater experience, and that could include acting, directing, or improv work. And this could be either in college or universities, community or professional settings. And then there's also a paid experiences drama therapist requirement and um, supervision. <clears throat> and again, you can see the National Association for Drama Therapy is listed there. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. Okay, now music therapy. This definition is from the American Music Therapy Association uh, in 2004. And uh, we say that music therapy is the clinical and evidence based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. So there are many important parts of this definition. The, the first part that I like to point out is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions because we do have some research base. We're continually trying to uh, increase that, and then there are case studies um, and less formal types of research to back up what we are doing. Um, Another thing that is very key in this uh, definition is the therapeutic relationship because uh, it's not like somebody would be handing someone a CD and say, here, listen to the CD and call me in the morning. Also, the individualized goals, we've talked about them already in terms of each of the other therapies, but it is very much looking at each person, where he or she is, what he or she needs. And um, the credentials we'll talk about in a minute. And um, as you've seen in some of the other uh, slides, we are talking about the, uh, programs that have to be approved by the association. Uh, sometimes there's other associations that approve it as well. For example, we have to have National Association of School of Music approval. Okay. Um, and this is one difference. Uh, that the entry level in music therapy at this time is a bachelor's degree as opposed to a master's. However, we do have a lot of master's and doctoral training available. Again, in this program, there are <clears throat> a large number of clinical training and internship requirements. We start with practicum experiences within the um, undergraduate training, and then the internship is the final training. And we, too, have um, the association. We also have a certification board. So the credentials MTBC stand for Music Therapist Board Certified, and that comes from the certification board for music therapists. There is an exam, and then um, every five years there's a recertification. You might also see some of these other acronyms. They are actually being phased out. So the main thing that you should look for is an MTBC, and there might be other specializations beyond that. Music therapists uh, uh, involve the specialized use of the music in the service of individuals with needs in mental health, physical health, habilitation, rehabilitation, or special education. And our purpose is to help individuals attain and maintain maximum levels of functioning. <clears throat> and these could be in non-musical goal areas primarily goal areas such as behavioral and psychosocial skills, communication and language skills, cognitive, perceptual motor, physiological responses, things like that. And um, although, as I said, the goals are generally non-musical, that's not to say that a person couldn't improve his or her musical skills as a byproduct, but that probably would not be the main focus. Treatment is prescriptive and it's implemented either individually Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Hold on. Individually or in a group. <clears throat> and also, in all instances, there is assessment, treatment planning, and documentation. This is a copy of an article about a music therapist who works in the burn unit of Metro Health Hospital in Cleveland here. And um, the... Music therapist works with patients during their dressing changes, which has been reported to be uh, the most painful experience. 
in terms of medical uh, procedures. And so this young boy, teenager, is uh, alternately engaged in, an, in playing the chimes, and so this can distract him from his pain. Sally, I believe you wanted to add something there or not? I, I think for the sake of time. Okay. Should, yeah. All right, so we're going to move on and talk about drumming up support for the arts and health care. Okay. <clears throat> When this comes on, okay, I'm going to go quickly through this. We have um, a lot of information that uh, sh uh, talk about studies in creative arts and healthcare and show that there are links to the following trends. So uh, some of them are related. I'm going to let you all read them yourself, but they're related to improvement um, or delay of the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Um, reduce incidence of depression, medical improvements, um, retention and caregiver satisfaction. So staff retention in a hospital, for example, has been improved and increased with the use of the creative arts therapies and improved quality of life. <clears throat> also, shortened length of hospital stay, fewer medical visits, improved patient compliance during certain procedures. And this is a really key one here. Um, the reduced use of pain, anti-anxiety medications, and sedatives because um, not only is that cost effective for a hospital, it's also better for a patient to not have all those extra drugs in their system. And then improved recovery time and reduced need for a, a higher levels of acute care. <clears throat> okay, just a second. All right, and we're back to Sally. Okay, on to the next slide. So now we're going to um, talk, we've talked a lot about creative arts therapies, and we're going to talk about artists working in healthcare settings. And this list is, is just to name a few. There are so many hundreds of ways in which artists are coming in and working in healthcare settings that are quite wonderful. Um, so they're working at the bedside directly with patients, uh, providing you know music and art experiences. They are coming around with art carts that can be full of different uh, visual arts materials or music instruments and coming into the patient rooms and areas. They are providing concerts and performances. These can be individual. You know, concerts playing, you know, as, as, you know, Rana talked about, you know, playing for an individual patient or, you know, providing a concert in a, uh, in a group gathering area or in the lobby, you know, for staff and, and visitors coming in. Artists are involved in the initial design of the space, and this is so important. So many of the new hospitals that are being built now are, you know, incorporating in artists into the actual, you know, design of the structures, and uh, so, you know, they're becoming very artistic. There's interactive art, you know, being built right in. You know, if you go to some of the wonderful new children's hospitals in San Diego and in Akron and Cleveland, and, you know, they're just, it's, it's just right there. You know, you walk in and you can tell an artist was involved with the design of this space, um, and which immediately, you know, brings down everybody's stress level and makes it a much more in, enjoyable and, and what usually is a difficult experience of being hospitalized. So artists are coming in as curators. They're doing art exhibits. Uh, it can be of, you know, artists' work from the community or of patients' artwork. Um, Artists of all disciplines are choosing, you know, music, art, poetry, dance, or whatever that is appropriate for, you know, those types of hospital settings. And they are working with patients one-to-one -one and in groups. And they are also providing caring for caregiver activities. And this is extremely important because this is, you know, providing arts experiences for the staff. And um, not only is it wonderful for the staff because of all the benefits, you know, that the arts have, but also when the staff are involved, then they get to directly experience the benefits of the arts, which means that they're going to have greater knowledge of and be able to more support these experiences continuing, you know, with the patients in their, in their particular hospitals. Rana? All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I just want to briefly talk about other artists in healthcare. All right, so she went, uh, Sally went over the list of a lot of the different possibilities of roles, and uh, the list that I have here: clinical musicians, music practitioners, music thanatologists, music healers, sound healers, harp therapists, are just examples in the music domain 
of a variety of other artists. There's also comparable artists such as these in the, in the other art forms. And you'll find a great variability among these people. Some have specific training, some do not. Some have goals, some do not. Some interact directly with the patients and families. Some just go in and play or have more passive experiences. So uh, we believe that these roles will actually be expanding. You might find more examples as the uh, time goes on and arts and healthcare becomes even more prevalent. So now I'm going to turn it back to Sally. Great. Um, so, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about how do you get trained as an artist. We've talked about how you uh, get trained as a creative arts therapist, but to be trained as an artist working in a healthcare setting. And, um, you know, this is, of course, artists have been coming into healthcare settings for quite a while now. And, and the way most of the training, you know, occurred until recently was that you would be trained in your specific hospital. And, you know, for instance, in the program that I run here at Napa State Hospital, I've been bringing artists in for the last 20 years, and I'm the one that's training them in how, you know, to do their art form in a way that's appropriate in this setting. But fortunately, now there are also a number of, of different training programs that are very specific where artists can go and get this training and then actually, you know, maybe get a certification and have, you know, a credential that they can take then to a healthcare facility and say, I've gone through this and um, which, you know, makes me more qualified to work in this setting. And so I'm going to uh, go through a few of them. Uh, the first one is at the Creative Center in uh, New York City. And this is a wonderful program, and it's actually free to artists. You apply and you go and you're, you're there for a week, uh, and you are, uh, you know, doing seminars and workshops led by, you know, many wonderful health professionals in the New York City area. And these are taking place at uh, leading medical centers in New York also. And also the Creative Center is bringing this training um, across the country now. You can actually contact them, um, and they will bring the training to other places, uh, other healthcare facilities uh, in the country. So that's a really wonderful service that they are offering. Temple University has also just begun an artist uh, in residence training program. Um, uh, focused specifically for musicians and visual artists who are interested in doing this type of work. And this involves uh, four days of full instruction there and then an eight-week eight supervised internship. Uh, the University of Florida at Gainesville, and they, ha they have been forerunners in the arts and medicine field for decades now, and they have a long-established program for training um, artists to work in healthcare settings inv involving much coursework, actual certificates, and you can also get the certificate through the University of Buffalo or the uh, University of Michigan. And they do internships, and they have a summer intensive program, uh, and that's also available at the University of Buffalo as well. So there are, are many programs, and these programs are growing. And, and what's great about these three programs that I've just mentioned is that they are they're pretty time limited. So, you know, like there was one question from a participant about training in Southern California. And even though these programs are not in Southern California, they are only programs that are a few weeks long. And so you could, you know, maybe, you know, whereas it would be difficult to leave your area for a year, but you can maybe go to another area of the country for a few weeks to get, you know, one of these, uh, one of these trainings. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about artists and creative arts therapists working in healthcare settings and the similarities and um, the differences between them. Uh, in terms of similarities, all art is therapeutic, um, but does that but that doesn't make it therapy, and so that's a key distinction just in terminology there. So both believe in the power of the arts to heal, relieve suffering, elevate, uh, elevate presence and awareness and improve the quality of patients' lives. The photograph you see there is actually from uh, the program that I run here at Napa State Hospital. This is part of our 7,000 square foot studio gallery space. And all of the artwork that you see in there is done by the patients. And this space is used for all of our creative arts classes, so poetry, theater, visual arts classes. Um, and this space is used by creative arts therapists to uh, run you know, groups in. So it's a wonderful shared space that we have. So the differences in terms of you know how artists work and how creative arts therapists work. So artists are are, are 
in these settings to foster participation of an appreci and appreciation of the arts by facilitating patients creating these art forms, art, music, dance, drama, and poetry, uh, facilitating performances, um, and, you know, selecting and exhibiting uh, visual art um, in these settings. Creative arts therapists are doing all of those things, plus they are providing you know, individual and group therapy sessions where they are working with the patients regarding you know, the personal meaning that's coming out of their, their art expression. They're helping, helping to facilitate awareness of that meaning and what it might have to teach the particular person about themselves and how they can achieve optimal health. And they are working directly you know, as a member of the clinical teams and um, and they also are you know trained to be providing individual and family assessments and evaluations. So here's just some general differences in uh, focuses and goals of artists uh, and creative arts therapists. So artists, you know, their focus and goals um, are going to include providing enjoyable, constructive, relaxing, and engaging arts activities that, you know, re help to reduce anxiety, discharge tension, and they are enhancing and bringing beauty into the healthcare environment just by, you know, their presence and what they're doing. The arts, as we all know, are wonderful for enhancing any environment. And they are also teaching artistic skills that aid with rehabilitation. And at my hospital, this is a really key component of what we do because, you know, the patients are sometimes in here for quite a long period of time and they, they can take an art class and actually get, you know, some of their educational requirements, you know, taken care of that way. And they are taking art classes in which they are learning skills that can actually help them when they are discharged uh, in terms of occupations that they may want to pursue on the outside. Side. And so the artists are enhancing creativity and feelings of competence and of contributing to the overall quality of the patient's lives. The creative arts therapists, their goals, same as the artists, but then with the addition of um, the goal of assessing and treating the patient's particular health issues, assisting the patients with developing skills for maintaining their health, uh, promoting expression of feelings that may be hard to put into words. Uh, and helping the patients to gain insight and enhanced self-reflection. So um, what, we, what we've got here is we'd like to just, you know, there's a few areas of, of caution when, you are, when you're coming into this field. Um, and the first one is another uh, quote from Judith Rubin. In order to offer artist therapy, it is essential that you be trained as a clinician. Even the most sensitive artist or our teacher is not a therapist. Uh, and if you're not a trained therapist, be sure in whatever setting you're working in that you have access to and supervision from staff who are and with whom you can consult regarding any issues that may arise with the patients. Also, any issues that may arise with you. It can, you know, emotions can be evoked when you're working with patients, and it's very important that you've got the support and supervision of the clinical staff in the setting that you're working with um, to help deal with these issues. Also, as we've gone over a little bit before, but make sure you're only using art modalities in which you yourself are proficient and with which you have had much experience. Sometimes people, you know, say, uh, you know, a, a dancer or a musician may come in and, and decide that they want to do some visual arts also with patients, but they're not experienced with that. And you can actually do harm. I've seen situations where people who didn't know how to use the materials, for instance, handed, you know, a patient um, some watercolor paints, but the paper that they gave them was too thin to hold the watercolors, and the patient started painting, and the paper just started to disintegrate. And so, and then, instead of a stress-reducing experience for the patient, it became anxiety-provoking and stress-producing. So, you never want to use any materials that you don't know very well yourself and have used very well yourself and know what those properties are. Are. Uh, and be sure that you do not refer to what you do as art therapy, dance therapy, music therapy, et cetera, unless you are actually credentialed therapist in one of those specific fields. I'll turn this back to Rana. Some more notes of caution. As an artist, when you're entering a healthcare setting, you need to be knowledgeable of and abide by at all times the standards of professional conduct that are required for the context and for the facility where you're working. So, for example, um, in my case, our music therapists are employed here at our campus, but then they also go to a variety of social service, 
um, medical and educational settings. So not only do they have to abide by our rules from our employee handbook, but they from um, HR, but they would have to abide by any um, rules that happen in the agencies where they're placed. And if you're artists or you're working as an artist right in a facility, then you're an employee of that facility often unless you're a contractor. But so if you're an employee, you need to abide by many of their rules and regulations as well. If you're not a trained therapist, your intention, goal, or focus should not be to directly elicit or evoke emotional expressions because you, you, once you evoke them, you need to know how to deal with them. So you need to be educated and prepared to respond appropriately, professionally, and ethically to a variety of scenarios that might arise. And just know that if you ask a question or put something out there and encounter a response or a situation that you don't feel is something you can handle, that you do have someone else at the facility to whom you could refer the patient to deal with this issue. Just as Sally had mentioned uh, in the dance classes, if she finds someone that really um, needs more work in a certain area, she can refer that person to the dance therapist. Yeah, I'm really, just like, oh, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to interject one other um, little thing there, too, just a little case example, uh, which goes to this, which is just a few weeks ago here in one of our painting classes, the patient did some work that was some imagery from a dream that he had had, and the imagery that was coming out was actually sort of gruesome. And um, so the dance, the excuse me, the art teacher is, you know, is not trained to, to deal with that, but what she did was she came to me, and then we immediately referred that patient to the art therapist where it would be the perfect place for him to get into what is this imagery about what does it have to teach him and the art therapist can process it with him in a way that the art teacher is not qualified to thanks and to go back to what uh, the first bullet on the page also if if you're um a hospital employee, let's say, you would have to attend the orientation that's for all hospital employees. So there's certain things that would be groundwork that you'd have to cover, um, getting TB testing, all those kind of things. You just uh, There's a lot of components. And I just wanted to point out kind of to wrap this up that the arts in healthcare to me is really a continuum. It's a continuum starting with volunteers then you could have paid artists and professionals who might be performers or might be uh, fulfilling any of the roles that we mentioned on the many lists that we provided with you, you know, the art carts, the art at the bedside, the, the curators, et cetera. And then there's also the creative arts therapist. And all these people on this continuum can play a valuable role for the patients, families, and um, staff in the various facilities in which we work. Well, you need to uh, advance the slide, please. Thanks. And so here we've provided you with our contact information. Um, also, if you have more questions that we don't answer today, feel free to use the online Ask the Experts feature of the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, and you can find details about that on their website. Okay, and next. Um, is the page that we mentioned about all the websites as well as um, the Temple University Training Program contact is Yoka Brat. Uh, that's her email there, jbrat at temple.edu. And we've provided you just a few books that we like as introductions. And as you'll see, we've only really talked about introductory art therapy and music therapy books, but there are comparable books in the other areas. Okay. So um, finally, um, the last slide here, this is an image of a mural done by the patients and uh, with one of the artists instructing uh, here at my hospital. And this quote has, has been on the door of my office for the last 20 years, so I wanted to share that with you. And then also the video that okay. I'm hoping that most of you were sent an email with a, with a link to a music video on YouTube. If you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, please do as soon as you can. And we just wanted to share this with you because this, um, to me, just sort of, you know, talks about what it's, you know, why it is that we are all doing this in this field. And the power of this art does not necessarily reside in any rational rationale, but it stands alone without reason as moving and uplifting. And this is how art works as a healing agent without ever having to put it into words. So that's it. 
So now we're going to open it up um, for questions. And first, we're going to address um, some of the questions that were sent in ahead of time. And uh, what I'm going to do, a, a lot of the questions were covered in the webinar. Um, if, you at, if you sent in a question and we don't address it right now, that means that we thought that it was addressed in the webinar. But if you have a further thing you'd like to ask us about it, we can, we can address that. But um, the first question that I will address is, how can we make a, craze, a case for creative arts even without an art therapist? We often we offer creative arts activities in music, lobby, uh, floor music performance for staff, visitors, patients. When patients are involved, we work with the OT psych staff to provide appropriate patient care. It seems like everything I read frowns on art activities unless they are led by a registered art therapist. How you can make the case, I think, for, um, for artists coming in is, first of all, to find out what are the concerns. Why is it you know, that someone thinks you only should use an art therapist? Um, so, and it may be that if you know, what they're wanting is more of a clinical um, therapy experience, that you do need an art therapist. But you know, to make the case for bringing in an artist, you can remind people that, or the administrators, um, that the artist will always be under the supervision of a clinician, perhaps suggesting that artists that are interested in working in your facility get one of, go through one of these certificate programs that you know, would sort of add a credential to them uh, to help to, you know, to say to your facility, look, this person's actually gone through this training, and you know, we can assure you that they're going to be supervised. Um, so that, that would be my general answer to that question. And then if you have more that you'd like to ask about it, we'd be happy to address that. Um, then somebody asked, what are some job opportunities in the healing arts and art therapy in schools that offer coursework in Southern California? There are two graduate art therapy programs in Southern California. One is at Loyola Marymount University, and another one is at the Phillips Graduate Institute in Encino. Um, and then for healing arts training, you know, any of the training programs that we mentioned. Um, and then also you could contact a great organization in, in um, San Diego is Aesthetics Incorporated, headed by Annette Reidenauer, who's been involved with the Society for the Arts and Healthcare since its inception. And she's been extremely involved with artists going into healthcare settings in Southern California, so she would be a great resource for you as well. Um, another question that was well, that was put forward was, do you find that professional artists can be trained to become creative arts therapists if they desire to slightly change their careers later, or do they have to get a counseling degree, degree also? And I think that it's pretty clear from the presentation that yes, if you want to become an art therapist, you actually need to go through art therapy training. Um, it's not just a counseling degree. It's, it is a uh, – all of the creative arts therapies have their own specific degrees. Um, so I will turn the – Questions over to Rana now. Okay. Another question that was asked was, please explain the difference in training and certification, especially within the healthcare setting. And um, we covered a lot of this in the presentation, but one thing we did want to point out to help clarify was that the certification does come after training, regardless of whether it is in a creative arts therapy or in some of the other types of arts and healthcare. There are still a number of different types of training available, and then the, those that have certification would come after that, okay? Another question was, who best validates certification by NETA, the National Expressive Therapy Association, now since the passing of the founder? And we just suggest that who, um, whoever wrote this question could call the organization and find out from them. Okay. Another important question was, how can we empower certification to become licensure, and is it worth my while to acquire a license in a neighboring state, meanwhile, since my state does not offer it? So our, our answer to this is really, it all depends. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things, where you live, your plans for the future. But what we really suggest is that you work with your various states and the creative arts therapy organizations that they're associated with. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, in the American Music Therapy Association, we have many, many state music therapy task forces because each state has issues specific to that state. And so the state task forces address only those issues pertinent to that state at that time. 
So our suggestion to you would be to get involved in these organizations. Another, another suggestion I have is to take an advocacy workshop, if you haven't done that before, or to attend um, a Hill Day in your state or the Arts Advocacy Days in Washington, D.C., which are coming up in April. Okay, and then we got a few more questions um, today. How do artists and creative art therapists interact with constituent populations? Well, we think we gave you a very brief introduction to that. Um, what would you say is the best way to teach the differences in clinical roles versus artists in residence creative arts to undergraduate art therapy students? Well, we've covered part of that, and you um, could certainly refer them to this webinar that gives some of the basics. Um, here in Maryland, we get many emails from our website from art students and healthcare students wanting a hands-on experience with an art therapist. Is there a place for them to search for volunteer experiences through the art and healthcare organization? I'm not sure if there is a place through SA, but certainly, again, you could refer these students to the various creative arts therapy organizations in their area. A lot of these organizations have not just a national organization, but regional um, branches of those, which SA does as well, and also state organizations in the various art forms. And then finally, are there, how are the distinction of each role applied to practice environments? And again, we feel like we've covered that in the presentation. So uh, at this time, if there's any other questions, I think Michelle can Yes, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to um, take off the lecture mode, and we'll take a couple of questions um, if anybody has any questions that um, came up from the webinar. So hold on one moment, and then we'll be able to hear the participants. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Hello? Does anybody have any questions? I have a question about an answer that was given to a question that was just mentioned. Which okay. One? The question having to do with who best validates um, people that have been certified by the National Expressive Therapies Association, who best to, um, to go to, that wasn't answered. Well, that I was, cannot but, go back to that organization because it doesn't exist uh, because the founder is, has died. Okay, well, we weren't aware that the uh, that the organization no longer exists. Nobody grandfathered it. Uh -huh. Um So we really we don't know the answer. Then right. that is something that that it, that it would take that organization to um, you know to to let you know. And I don't know if there's any other way you can contact them or not. But we really don't know. Uh, you know, we we are not that organization, so we don't have an answer for that. Sorry. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, you did a great job explaining, like for students, I'm a, um, an instructor for um, undergraduate art, people taking introduction to art therapy. And I, I think it's a really important role for me to distinguish what you did in your presentation, which was very thorough. But how can I get um, a hold of this? in order to use it as a teaching. Can oh, okay. I, well, yeah, PowerPoint. when is it going to be published, or when is it going to be available right. so that I can kind of integrate it? Because I would really love to say that I got this directly from Society for the Arts and mm -hmm. Healthcare so that they are informed when they go back to their internships. A lot of them are child life, mm -hmm. um, undergraduate social work students, nurses, Right. Well, we'll post it on the Society's website in the next couple of weeks. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to send me um, an email, I can um, email you a, a PDF of the slide presentation. Okay. If that, is, if that will tide you over uh, in the Is this interim. Sally or Ron? No, this is Michelle. That's actually Michelle. Michelle comes okay. from the association herself. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All That's right. okay. I will. Okay. Are there any other questions? We'll take one more. I actually have a question. Sure. Okay. Um, I work for a nonprofit arts organization. My background is in fine arts. I have a, a master's in fine arts. Um, but through my job, we are doing a lot of community engagement programs. Um, 
and some in healthcare and and things like that. So this is why I'm interested in this. I'm I'm learning about art therapy as sort of a new perspective on art. Um, and uh, when talking about art therapy, there's an emphasis on the um, the patient's experience with art as a way of self-expression, as a way, um, you know, to heal them um, therapeutically. But as an artist, really the main the main um, goal of art is to communicate. It's something that, you know, I might create art so that other people looking at it um, understand. It's, it's something outside of myself that I right. hope um, mm-hmm. relates to other people. So I guess I'm I'm wondering if if bridging this, um, you know, where art on the one hand um, can be self-expressive and can be therapeutic, but then on the other hand is meant really for an audience. I, I want or if there's, I don't know, if you've thought of ways to kind of bridge that, or, or I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm understanding yeah. exactly What's what your question, question is. In this. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with you. Okay. <laughs> but I'm wondering what the question is. I guess my question is, um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out in my head when I think of art um, from an artist artist perspective, uh, I think of it as something that's used to. to communicate with an audience, whereas from an art therapeutic perspective, it's used as, by the patient to um, express themselves. Right. And, I'm, and I guess I'm wondering, um, in terms of the artist's role, if there's a way to, to encourage um, the patient to create art that might be impactful for an audience as well, or if... Because that's what artists well, normally do is think about an audience. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that happens, I think, um, uh, inherently in all of, you know, with the arts classes that I, that I supervise here at our hospital. We do an annual huge exhibit of the patient's artwork. You know, the artwork is, is constantly up here. So, the, so, you know, they're in an art class, and as any, you know, um, focus of an art class is often, you know, doing work that's going to be shown to an audience. Mm-hmm. So that is, is happening automatically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that's just a, a part of, of the process, I think, with any art form. Um, you know, uh, that, you know, musicians are, are, you know, working to perform, not always. You, need, you don't always want to have an audience, but I think it's something that is pretty natural uh, with the arts. And when we, we do our poetry classes every few years, then we take the best of the, of the writings and we publish anthology of the patient's poems. So that's going out to the public. So that, that is, is automatically happened, and that's considered a, a very important part of, of the um, arts experience with the patients because then they, when, you know, their work is shown or performed, you know, it's just got that, that added, you know, self-esteem boosting and competence and, and all of that. Um, is this answering your question? Or? The other thing, can I, can I interject yeah. here a second? Um, I think that maybe the, the caller or the person asking the questions might not understand how vulnerable the patient might be mm-hmm. and how they really mm-hmm. do not want their artworks viewed by others because it's a, that would create a little emotional, you know, unsafe oh, situation absolutely. You for did, them. Right. You, so you absolutely would, never, you never exhibit a patient's artwork unless they have given you express permission to do so. Yeah. So, so that might be, that might help a little bit in terms of like the, the art process that mm-hmm. is very much not wanting to be viewed. However, an artist can, can do both. They can create for others to see, but then they mm-hmm. might, leading up to their final piece, they're knocking out and doing the creative process, and they wouldn't want that to be viewed. Well, that's mm-hmm. the kind of work that is done more therapeutically, okay. that knocking out the ideas and trying to increase their awareness and what they want to actually um, communicate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But but I would also say that um, even in an um, a non-therapeutic environment that it would still obviously have to be the patient's choice yes. whether or he or she wanted something to be um, exhibited, performed, et cetera, you know, and, and mm-hmm. you would need to have them sign a written um, approval. Okay. Right. Okay. right. Yeah, um, I, I just I, want to remind all the participants, too, that um, 
you can email myself or Rana too. Like, and if if you feel like you know you have another question that comes up, you know, after the webinar or you'd like further discussion, please feel free to contact us. Um, you know, I'm more than happy. And you know, some of these these questions and some of these these issues, you know, you sort of think them through as you're as you're thinking about it. So things may come up, and just know that we are continually available to you. And you can also um, go to the SAW website and, and do an Ask the Experts thing, too, and get other um, consultants' opinions as well. But we are available to you even Great. after the webinar ends. Well, thank you, Sally, and thank you, Rana, for um, such an excellent presentation. And thank you to all the participants for uh, staying with us these extra few minutes uh, to cover some of the questions um, that you submitted in advance and also had live. Um, you will be receiving an evaluation email, um, and uh, we ask that you please take a couple minutes to fill it out so that you can help us um, you know, get some feedback on how the webinar program is working for you and so that we can continue to improve it. Um, and uh, I think then <laughs> I think that Sally actually to, uh, went over all of the things that I, that, I, that I go over at the end of these webinars. So uh, thank you, Sally and Rana. And um, we hope to see you at a webinar in the future or hear you. Or <laughs> How can we look at another, a slide that we saw? Like there's one in the 20s that I want to look back at before. Sure. Um, if you want, uh, I'm going to post the PowerPoint on the Society's website, and it will be under uh, the archive session. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Thank All right. You. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.